Ancient medical treatments, horrible tests, and some questionable gifts. Yeah, here we go. History is quite odd. Welcome back to Bumblebee. I'm Taylor McWaters, and here are the top 10 dark mistakes in history we should never repeat. Number 10, adhesive bras. Okay, we'll kick this list off with a sticky mess right off the hop. Back in 1949, Life Magazine released an article that caught everybody's attention, obviously. May 16th, 1948, the article read, for 5,000 years, clothes have been draped, tied, buttoned, pinned, and buckled on the human form. Now at this point, somebody walking by would go, oh, what's, what's this about? Then it continues, this year, for the first time in history, they will be glued on. Yes, what in the world, how? How is that possible? One newspaper, please, let's do it. Inventor Charles Langs, he changed the game in 1949. He made bra cups that would stick to you with adhesive. He was the OG who did this. Now, it didn't feel too good. Didn't quite work right off the bat, as most things do. The special glue, this adhesive, was promised to leave behind no residue. It was promised to be painless, yet at the same time, stay glued on, even if you were to jump into a pool from 10 feet high. That was the cell, yeah. Sounds kind of impossible, right? It was. Number nine, facial expressions experiment. Okay, here's a wild one. We're gonna get dark right off the bat, immediately changing up the vibe. The facial expressions experiment was no good. Back in 1924, a psychologist with the University of Minnesota, he wanted to conduct an experiment to study facial expressions, right? Sounds pretty harmless so far, dare I say, sounds a little bit silly. More specifically though, he wanted to see if everybody's expressions of emotions were the same. Does happiness look the same on everyone? Does sadness look the same? What about fear? What about shock? What about disgust or anger or even pain? Yeah, so he recruited some volunteers, didn't tell them all the details from campus, and then he painted the lines of their facial muscles black. He wanted to see how each muscle would move, even the slightest movements. He then exposed each participant to different stimuli in order to photograph their reactions, and then compare the results to everyone else, which would look kind of creepy on a wall now that I'm talking about it. It gets worse when you find out what the stimuli actually contained. I guess this guy wanted big reactions because he included showing them adult films, he exposed them to ammonia, he made them touch reptiles and dangerous animals, and of course, he exposed them to horrible things that I can't even talk about here on YouTube. Yeah, you can only imagine back in the day what the he saw, it was horrible. Yeah, horrible, right? That's a sad face, big sad face in that one. For eight, the Detroit Ice Fountain. Located in Washington Boulevard, the Detroit Ice Fountain was Obviously, such a hazard. We can never do this again. This is horrible, you'll never see this. It was a spectacle, of course, but it was a hazard nonetheless. Back in the early 1900s, a fountain was the talk of the town during colder months. The water jets would run all year long for some reason. No one wanted to shut those off. They just let them go. So in turn, this fountain would freeze and pile up, and then freeze and pile up, and so on and Danforth. Now eventually, it reached up to 60 feet tall, made of pure ice, right there on Washington Boulevard. It was a tourist attraction at that point. This was so dangerous. Yeah, shifting ice, dangling 60 feet above your loved one. What could go wrong? I can only imagine. Just tons of ice cracking all around you. Families would just gather around. It was horrible. The tradition has now moved to Bell Island, so you can safely observe ice trees instead. A little bit nicer, yeah. Just not in the middle of the street anymore. Please, thank you. Number seven, spin doctors. Oh, this is amazing. Remember when you were a kid and you'd spin around with your friends and make yourself dizzy and be like, oh my God, it's great. Or I guess if you're just doing that now, it's cool too, sure. If you're a weird adult. It's all fun and games until somebody passes out or hits their head, right? That's why we don't do it often. Well, back in the mid 19th century, this was how medical experts would put you to sleep. Yeah, more specifically, this is how they used to treat schizophrenia and other mental illnesses. This is, they would just spin them and then see what happens. There was a whirling chair and a whirling bed, so you can pick your fate, I guess. A whirling bed, you ever lay down after a night out and you feel like your bed's spinning? It was that times a thousand, pretty much. They would spin these poor patients around until they blacked out, and the goal was to literally shuffle the contents of their brain around. That was their medical advice. Yeah, I'm glad we don't do that anymore. Imagine going into the hospital and being like, yeah, I got hit in hockey, my head kind of hurts a bit, I don't know. They're like, oh, no problem. Just get on the zipper here and just spin around for a hot minute. See how you feel. Number six, animal droppings. Hey, got a sore throat? No sweat, dog will fix that. Animal droppings being used in history for medicinal practice will always be hilarious. But it checks out, right? You have to look at the facts. Makes a lot more sense than spinning a guy until he's unconscious, that's for sure. 
Ancient Egyptian doctors, they would use donkey, gazelle, fly, and dog droppings to ward off bad spirits. Microflora was often found in these droppings, so the consensus was that these properties could include antibiotic substances as well. So poop was used for medicinal purposes as well in history. In 1957, a microbiologist, Stanley Falco, he began instructing folk to eat their own poop Ew. for medical reasons, which we here on Bumblebee actually disagree with. Don't do that. I'll tell you what you can do though, subscribe. That's much nicer, that has better results than eating your own. We don't want that. Number five, reindeer pet. Okay, Olivia and I are talking about a dog, but a reindeer? Maybe, I'll try and convince her. June 1941, the Germans were attacking the Soviet Union. It was one of the biggest attacks in history, and Britain and US had to send weapons, supplies, anything really, just to keep them afloat. Just to keep them in the fight, okay? So they sent these supplies through the Arctic Circle, which was the only route. But of course, it was littered with U-boats. Now thankfully, the British HMS Trident was there to watch the waters, and in turn, the Soviets were able to fight on. So so as a gift, as a thank you, the Soviets sent the captain of said trident, the World War II submarine, they sent them a live reindeer. Here you go, don't eat them, just enjoy them. Please, just enjoy the reindeer. The British had to accept, because of course it was ill-mannered if they didn't. So yeah, they had to keep a six foot tall, real life, alive reindeer on a submarine. That's, that's so stressful. She probably had a horrible time. Her name was Pollyanna and they brought her on board through a torpedo tube. That was her little commute onto the thing. She was a crew member for six weeks. Six weeks. Talk about smell, that's gonna, who pee you. Six weeks in there, get out of here. She slept better than most, believe it or not. She shared a room in the captain's quarters. Again, imagine the smell, I'm just saying. Number four, ice baths. We mentioned an ice fountain earlier, that was for sure a hazard, but let's talk about some old ice remedies. So if you saw somebody having an ice bath today, you wouldn't think anything of it, right? Maybe they just finished leg day and they're trying to reduce inflammation. Maybe they're trying to improve breathing, all that good stuff, you know? But back in the day, ice baths weren't just for athletes, right? They were meant for those who had rabies. Yeah, athletes and rabies, here you go, hop in. Rabies was of course a growing concern in Europe in the 1700s, so a treatment was to take 40 grains of ground liverwort, add some pepper, mix it up in milk, and then drink it, as well as having a nice bath. Both those things right there, there we go. Do that four times a day and rabies should be gone. Historically, that's, it didn't happen, but that's what they wanted to happen. That's like a fear factor challenge. That's one of the worst things I've ever heard. Liver milk in a nice bath, horrible. Happy Sunday, I guess. Number three, tapeworms. Back in the Victorian times, they really figured out the trick to weight loss. Nice. Was it watching what you eat, counting your steps, maybe getting a gym membership at ye old gym? No, no, it was way easier than all those combined. And you didn't even have to pull back on what you ate. How great is that? All you needed was a handy tapeworm. Yeah, a little, a little tapeworm inside you all the time. You know those things that can kill you if you get one today? Yeah, that was their plan back in the Victorian days. The plan was, if you eat a tapeworm egg, it will later hatch in your stomach, and at that point, you could just eat anything you wanted, because every time you ate the tapeworm, he would also eat, so you could get your snack on while still rocking those Victorian skinny jeans, know what I'm saying? Tapeworm cyst pills or the Stairmaster? I don't know, take your bets. He's like, I'm hungry. Number two, smoking solutions. All right, don't smoke, don't do that. Here at Bumblebee, we say don't smoke. Back in 1665, during a plague in London, you were told to smoke cigarettes because they were considered disinfectants. This is wrong. This is again, don't smoke. Yeah, sore throat, no problem. I'm sure this pack of darts will help. Here you go. We mentioned before tobacco smoke enemas, which is hilarious, but this is just bad advice all around. Since mouth to mouth wasn't a thing until the 50s, if you were trying to save a drowning victim, you would ideally blow smoke in their face or their butts. Either way, don't do it, it's insane. And then cut to 1964, it turns out smoking is bad for us. Yeah, what? Oh, who knew, who would have thought? Yeah, it's pretty intense now. The photos on cigarette packages, they're haunting to look at. Number one, ants, man. Okay, I'm totally gonna jinx myself for this, but I've never broken a bone or gotten stitches in my life. Knock on wood, knock on wood. Chris, have you? Um, Bones or stitches? Bone yes, stitches no, okay. Comment down below. Bone yes, stitches no. That's gonna be a weird comment section, but I'm here for it. Many of my friends have gotten stitches in their life. It's obviously pretty common. So I figured I'd cap this list off going back to the origins 
of stitches because it sounds very painful and it's impressive. Going back to 3000 BC, once again, Egyptian literature, this is where you could find this. Stitches were first made from plants like hemp or cotton or animal tendons, animal arteries, you name it. Cat gut was common. That was thread made out of sheep intestines. That's a fun one to get right there. That's probably smelly. One of the craziest ways though of closing a wound was by using ants, real life ants, believe it or not. Leaf cutter ants or army ants, they would be held against the opening of your wound and you'd wait down for it to bite. Now, once the ant bit, you would cut its head off so that the head of the ant was still stuck biting onto your wound, staying there ideally until the wound heals up. Yeah, imagine Ant-Man shows up to save the day and he just shows a pocket full of army ants. Not what I expected at all, but still helps me. Thank you so much, Ant-Man, you're the best. Please send somebody else next time. Awesome, this is so itchy. Those are the top 10 dark mistakes in history we should never repeat. We'll see you next time, bye.